as I was reflecting on the, uh, my assignment, which is a balanced view of the Affordable Care Act, uh, I thought back to Harry Truman, who was president when I was a Stanford undergraduate and studying economics. And President Truman was famously quoted one day as saying, oh God, give me a one-armed economist. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, it's on the one hand this, and on the other hand it's that. <laughs> and, uh, but um, Stanford was turning out two-armed economists uh, in my day, and uh, so you're going to get a two-armed economist. Um, in thinking about uh, the healthcare situation and trying to place this in some historical perspective, it's important to bear in mind that the healthcare in this country is changing rapidly. It's a, it's a, you have to have a motion picture. If you just try to do a freeze frame, you'll miss an awful lot because a lot of people will be thinking thoughts that were relevant 10, 20, 50, 100 years ago. And uh, so I thought I'd just start with a little uh, reminder of uh, where we've come from. If we go back to 19th century medicine, say 1850 to 1950, uh, physician culture was one of autonomy, independence. Nobody interfere with my decisions. And even uh, physicians who were students of mine said, I was taught, don't depend on anybody else. You're responsible. Uh, among other things in this culture, there was a strong opposition to group practice. Uh, and doctors were sometimes uh, penalized. In fact, the famous Russell Lee, who founded the Palo Alto Clinic over here, uh, was expelled from the Santa Clara County Medical Society uh, for starting a multi-specialty group practice. Later on, I could explain to you the economic reasoning that led to that. But um, that meant loss of hospital privileges and, and a lot of other bad things. Um, the, the healthcare, the medical payment of those days was fee for service with the doctor and the patient negotiating the fee. You know, I've often thought, you know, when my kid is lying bleeding on the operating table, <laughs> is not the time when I want to pull out my pocket financial calculator and negotiate with the doctor on, on what the uh, fee is going to be. But fee-for-service has meant and still means a strong incentive to, to resolve all doubts and uncertainties in favor of doing more and more costly services. Well, also back in that era, few people had health insurance. And that was okay because doctors really couldn't do much anyway. <laughs> uh, also, the doctor owns his own records and doesn't share information with others. And the, the view that it's my patient and turf battles over, uh, uh, you know, what part of the body I own. I remember I was giving a talk like this uh, years ago to Stanford trustees, and one of them was my uh, Stanford classmate, Bill McCall, who went on from his all-Americanism on the football field to become an orthopedic surgeon. And he broke out laughing and he said, yes, you know, the podiatrists and the orthopedists are fighting over who owns the ankle. <laughs> also in this era, the focus was on acute care. That is, you have a problem, you come in, the doctor listens to your story, diagnosis, treats you, and that's it, it's over, goodbye. Uh, and also, research showed very wide variations in medical practice. You know, people thought, oh, if you're a doctor, then you know the right thing, and there is one simple, single right thing to do, and that's what you do. But I remember my friend Jacques Weinberg uh, did studies up in uh, Vermont where they broke up the state into about 10 different hospital referral areas and looked to, uh, analyzed to see what was the per capita incidence of tonsillectomy in children? And it varied tenfold, just huge variations. And then he wanted, went on to make a career documenting wide variations in medical practice. In other words, doctors don't all do the same thing with the same kind of patient. There, it, it, partly as he described it, because of medical uncertainty. Um, oh, this, was, this heading was meant to be hospitals. But uh, so I'll talk about hospitals. Generally, there were freestanding community hospitals, mostly nonprofit. 
and the orientation of the hospital administrator uh, was to fill the beds in order to co cover the overhead. I remember years ago, I was on the board of a hospital in Santa Monica, and I was sitting there taking it all in, and uh, the uh, occupancy was down. And people were talking to the hospital administrator in just the same terms that I remember as a limited partner in a real estate venture, we talked to our manager, what are you gonna to do to get the occupancy up? Now I was thinking naively, gee, you know, that's, uh, that's funny. We ought to be happy that people are, are healthier and there are fewer of them need to be in the hospital. And hospitals in those days began to compete for doctors with technology and, and facilities. I remember my friend, Dr. Paul Hellwood saying, what is it? Hospitals don't have patients. Hospitals have doctors, and doctors have patients. Well, moving forward then to the 20th century, uh, large-scale uh, health insurance came in about mid-century. Really, uh, World War II was the, the big watershed for that. And one of the things that that meant was when people are insured, they don't care what it costs or whether it's necessary or not. They just want more of everything because somebody else is paying for it. And so previously, medical spending was restrained by the patient's ability and willingness to pay. Now that, uh, that uh, they got insurance, well, that's gone. So in, especially in the latter half of the 20th century, there was a huge explosion of medical knowledge and technology exemplified, for example, by the fact that in the year 2000, uh, 25,000 articles were published reporting randomized controlled trials that's around the, around the world. Just a huge number. Um, and so the second half of the 20th century, there was a, a big struggle to introduce spending restraint. You know, healthcare shot up from 5% of the GDP to 18%, and how can we slow that down? Um, so the consequences of all that for the 20th century were, first, it cost too much, like 18% of the GDP, straining public and private finances, a lot of uh, bad quality care. You know, people think, oh, well, we got the best healthcare system in the world. Uh, that's not obvious if you look at it up close. I was reading an article the other day, research indicating that something like 400,000 deaths happen in hospitals per year because of errors and preventable errors. Uh, we got to where there was poor access, nearly 50 million people without health insurance because it was kind of priced out of reach. Um, and employers and Medicare essentially locked in their employees or their beneficiaries into what I call open-ended fee-for-service. That is the traditional model of paying for doctors. And most people didn't even have a choice. That is, most employed people, they come to work and the employer says, well, this is our health plan and that's it. Instead of doing, let's say, what we do at Stanford for our employees on health care, is we say, well, we're gonna offer you a menu of five or six different health plans that you might pick. And uh, we will pay for, the, the university will pay for the low-priced plan which around here is usually Kaiser Permanente. We think that's very good quality. If you want something that costs more, you pay the difference. That's the basic idea of managed competition. Um, so, more consequences in the 20th century. A huge amount of waste. A National Academy of Sciences report estimated some 30 to 40% of healthcare spending in this country is waste. That is, it just does not benefit the patient. Uh, more and more consciousness of the fact that we have an extremely complex system, just wildly complex uh, in, in, in its many aspects. You just think uh, there are thousands of different insurance plan designs and different employers and so forth. And so think of the poor Palo Alto Clinic. They have these people with huge number of different health plan designs, and they've got to figure out, uh, now for each person, what is it that the insurance pays, and we can bill the insurance, and what is it that the patient pays? 
Uh, and so you have very large clerical staffs um, uh, in these organizations. Uh, and physicians overwhelmed by new medical information. Just not possible for the ordinary single doc now to keep up with it all. It's one of our problems. Then let me just move forward to 21st century medicine. I think the future is becoming integrated delivery systems. Um, that is, with an ethos of and a culture of teamwork, shared responsibility for patients. Instead of the doc thinking, it's my patient, now a team of doctors from different specialties, if it's a complicated patient, need to work together. It's our patient and we need to share information and uh, uh, use our resources as best we can. Um, with the integrated delivery systems, uh, the important thing is that the incentives of all the players are aligned with what Dr. Berwick called the triple aim, that is better health, uh, better care, and lower cost. That's, that's where we need to move the system. Um, what else with ten, uh, 21st century medicine? Teams develop up-to-date practice guidelines. You know, with the 25,000 uh, uh, new randomized trials published each year, you really need a system, a teamwork uh, system to create uh, usable knowledge uh, and to turn the new discoveries into recommendations for the physicians for how to take care of that kind of patient. We're moving into standardization and simplification. Uh, focus on chronic conditions. I mentioned earlier with 19th century medicine, it was, it was uh, acute care. Now about three quarters of the costs of healthcare are for people with chronic uh, conditions, with diabetes, congestive heart failure, et cetera, et cetera, depression. Um, and a very promising development in my view that's starting to come into play now is some of the large benefits consulting firms have created uh, benefits exchanges, uh, Aon, Towers, Mercer have done this. So they contract, let's say Aon contracted with uh, Walgreens that they will put before each uh, patient, each worker, uh, a menu of maybe five or six different choices. And uh, the employer will make a fixed defined contribution. And like Stanford, uh, then the employee will make his choice. And I, I think that's just crucial, to me that's the highest priority thing, is just breaking out of the, of the situation where people don't have choices and into a kind of market, a market model. Uh, and that's, that's starting to happen now. Okay, that brings us to the Accountable Care Act, Affordable Care Act, which happened in about 2010. Uh, a good thing, uh, there are exchanges which we've all heard about because the implementation was so grievously botched. Uh, but for people who don't have employers uh, to broker, to arrange their health insurance, uh, they can go to the exchange. Now I think exchanges, as I was saying earlier, are a very good and important and necessary idea. My regret that I expressed to the Obamanots was that ought to cover everybody, not just people who don't have an employer. Uh, at least we ought to have every firm up to say 200 employees. I sometimes wonder, why not? I mean, that's the American way to give people responsible choices. Anyway, uh, so that's, that's a prominent well-known feature of the, of the Affordable Care Act. Also, other features, they enacted uh, what's called the Cadillac tax, an excise tax of 40% on the uh, excess of family premiums over $27,500 a year. That sounds wild, but I mean, normal projections of where things are going is we'll be there by 2018 when this thing uh, kicks in. And a lot of employers are starting to work hard, including Stanford. How can we avoid that tax? How can we keep the uh, premiums down? Uh, they also, to pay for the expanding coverage, they uh, reduced Medicare hospital patients, essentially payments. Essentially with Medicare, the government was saying each year we'll increase your payments by 
the amount of inflation and the cost of doing hospital business plus 1%. Well, they took the 1% away. Probably fine. Uh, they created what are call, called accountable care organizations uh, to modify the incentives for doctors and hospitals caring for Medicare patients. The idea with the accountable care organization is, again, to bring some teamwork and co cooperation into the, into the uh, situation by doctors and hospitals accepting responsibility for moderating the growth in uh, per person expenses. And if they can hold the cost to less than the uh, projections, then uh, they get half the savings. Now, I've been rather skeptical of that because I think the incentives are far too weak. It'd be better if we just had a market and they said, here you are, guys, if you don't really you know, give patients a good deal, high quality, good service, and so forth, you're just going to lose your business. Instead, it was, if you don't slow the growth in spending, uh, you won't get this uh, bonus. Uh, sometimes the way I put it is, is there we are in the boardroom with the doctors and the hospitals, and somebody in the back of the room who's skeptical says, you mean to tell me if we cut our revenue by a million dollars, then uh, we'll get to keep, we'll give, they'll give us back 500,000? Well, why don't we just keep the whole million? <laughs> I mean, there's a problem with the in incentives. I think, I think one of the problems is the people who designed this law uh, didn't study economics very much, at least they don't. <laughs> Uh, and finally, there was the Independent Payment Advisory Board, uh, which was to 15 uh, wise persons uh, would sit back, and if Medicare spending rose too much, then they could essentially make recommendations that would have the force of law uh, without checks and balances and so forth. Uh, that hasn't happened so far, and it probably won't. My guess is nobody's going to want that job. Now. What uh, have they done? I've talked about the big problems of access, cost, quality. What, it, what does it do for these problems? Well, uh, one good thing is they encouraged and subsidized the adoption of information technology. Another is to penalize hospitals for, in Medicare cases, for readmissions within 30 days, a generally accepted marker of, a, of a poor treatment. Generally speaking, I would say, with our very large quality problems, the Affordable Care Act didn't do much. Uh, for access to care, uh, the act provided uh, Medicaid for individual adults with incomes up to 1.3 times the uh, federal po poverty line. And for people with incomes higher than that, through the exchanges, there would be subsidies for people with in incomes all the way up to four times the federal poverty line. That's for a family of four. That's like uh, uh, ninety-four thousand dollars, nine thousand four hundred dollars. Uh, guaranteed issue, guaranteed renewal. Uh, that is, uh, if an insurance company is selling a uh, insurance plan to the public, they have to take all comers, the sick and the healthy. So. Um, uh, Guaranteed renewal, you can't take away the pol policy when the person gets sick. And an individual mandate, that is a law that if you don't have health insurance, you have to pay what economists call a free rider tax. That is, if you don't have health insurance, you know that when you get smashed up on the freeway and you get taken into the emergency room, by law for many years, the hospital has to take care of you, at least stabilize you. and. Uh, so there's been growing concern about free riding. I mean, a lot of people are, there's a kind of health insurance there. But the Affordable Care Act is definitely reducing the number of people who are uninsured from something like 50 million to 30 million. Uh, with complexity, I think it just made the whole problem worse. I mean, the thing is bewilderingly complex. Uh, what about fragmentation? Well, I talked about an accountable care organization, a team of physicians and hospitals that contract with Medicare to slow cost growth while maintaining quality, and then they can keep half the savings. I think accountable care organizations are an important step in the right direction. I just regret that uh, 
that they didn't uh, make the incentives uh, stronger because they need to be. It's a step toward an uh, integrated healthcare delivery system. Uh, you hear all the complaints about counterproductive taxes. To pay for all this, they um, imposed a 2.3% excise tax on drugs and devices, and the device manufacturing companies complain that we are starting to pay taxes on the revenues even before we uh, make any profits on the, on the product. And so it's been, I think, justly criticized as being anti-innovation. Similarly, there's a tax on, on insurers that, uh, uh, this is kind of an obscure point, but uh, they, nobody likes insurance companies, so we're going to make them pay. Well, the problem is the tax falls heavier on insurance companies that bear risk than half of employed people are in employers who are, where the employer is self-insured. There's no insurance company ex maybe to process the claims. Anyway, uh, it's a tax that works against uh, risk bearing, which I think is a mistake because um, what we need is to get insurance companies bearing the risk and then to making deals with doctors and hospitals to share the risk, to transfer the risk for the cost of care to doctors and hospitals. Uh, and I think the employer mandate is anti-jobs. At least my first reaction when I saw the whole thing was, if I was the CEO of a company, I would say, don't hire anybody. You know, wait till, because it takes away the ability. Of course, all employers, like 98% of employers of more than, than uh, 200 people uh, do provide health insurance, but it takes away the, their flexibility and their ability to, to uh, modify it to save money because it's all under federal regulation. So, uh, summary comments. Getting everyone covered is an important goal. I, I believe in that. I really think it's wrong to, to have a situation in which many people don't have access to health care because, especially children, because they, they can't afford it. And we really ought to have uh, universal health insurance. And the Affordable Care Act is a serious attempt to get there. Uh, I hear some people criticize it and say we want to repeal it and replace it. And then I'm listening, do I hear what the replacement is going to be? <laughs> I mean, that's what, you know, I have some friends who uh, want to, you know, I'd like to hear a little more about, uh, I mean, the Republicans, I think, could, could uh, improve their whole story if they would get together and come out with a credible and coherent alternative. I think that the whole thing is far too complex and it keeps changing. Uh, Nancy Pelosi famously said along the way, we're going to have to pass this law in order to find out what's in it. <laughs> and, and I'm pretty good friends with our benefits manager, who, because I'm, I chair the advisory committee. And uh, from time to time, he said, well, four years have gone by, and we still don't know what's in it. Uh, you know, the president is changing it all the time, slipping this deadline and that. Uh, and, and I think that there's uh, some serious overreach. I think we could have had universal health insurance in this country without passing a law that forces Georgetown University and uh, Notre Dame University for, as employers, for example, to provide uh, what they consider to be abortifacients, that is, abortion-causing uh, drugs. We just didn't have to take that issue on in, in this pro problem. Uh, Professor Uwe Reinhardt at Princeton uh, described it as an ugly patch on an ugly system. That's referring to the complexity and so forth. Uh, and I think it's too bad that they didn't break the link to employer-sponsored insurance and go for a simplified, real universal health insurance, which, for example, in the late, you know, latter part of the last decade, Senator Wyden from Oregon and Senator Bennett from Utah proposed, as did the Committee for Economic Development. There are ways you could do it. I mean, there's just a lot wrong with uh, it adds to the cost and complexity, et cetera, of employer-based health insurance. We're all used to it, but it is at the, at the heart of, 
of why we have these problems. So there we are. Thank you for your time and interest. And uh, good, good luck with your affordable health insurance. <laughs> Questions? They want to give you a mic. Right. Uh, yes, uh, Medicare, when it first was passed, uh, wasn't perfect either. There have been a lot of changes that have made it much better over the years. Yeah. And how can we change the Affordable Care Act to make it better, too? Uh, what, would you, what would you suggest? Well, to a single payer or like Medicare or do something else? Uh, well, I think, first of all, with the subsidies, they are means tested. You know, so that the, the exchange has to go to the IRS and get last year's tax reported. Et cetera, and uh, taxable income reported and so forth. So I would say the subsidy payments or the premium support payments ought to apply on a flat basis across the uh, income spectrum and not be means tested at that level, except for you can, well, if you want means testing, which I think is okay, then you would say these premium support payments uh, would be reported to the IRS and included in the recipient's taxable income. So that would reduce some of the cost to cost the government. But that would be one, one uh, major thing. Uh, well, let me just say, if you say, what do I think we ought to have? Uh, <laughs> depressingly, it's been 30 or so years since I proposed and published in the New England Journal of Medicine consumer choice health plan. And the idea was, in effect, universal health insurance based on regulated competition in the private sector. So everybody, the, the whole country ought to look like what we do at Stanford, which is we offer our employees a range of choices uh, where they are responsible for the costs above the cost of the low cost plan. And what happens is people will migrate to what they see as value for money. Okay, in, the, in the interest of transparency, I have to reveal that I'm a retired physician and I'm currently now a, a hospital medical administrator. So I dealt with some of these things. One of the problems even with the, with the exchanges and some of the plans is that people tend to sometimes pick the cheapest plan, the bronze plan, which makes them have a 40% deductible. And I had a deal with a woman the other day, came to our emergency room with a $5,000 bill, yeah. and here she had $2,000 that she was responsible for. Now, she didn't have very much money. She complained a lot. Well, I thought I had insurance. You know, that's, that seems to be, it's a kind of a trap for many people. They think they're insured, yeah. but they actually aren't completely insured. Yeah. That's a very good point. I wish I had included that in my prepared remarks. Uh, some of this is pretty lousy insurance, you know, with very high deductibles. And... Uh, for, for a lot of people, they're just not going to be able to afford the uh, up to the deductible. So I think what happens there is there are some people in the political world for whom it's more important to, for us to be able to say they're insured than for them actually to be insured. In my consumer choice health plan proposal, uh, there'd be a standard coverage contract and there'd be much less uh, deductibles. The cost consciousness would come in the premium. Yes. Uh, question. Pardon me. How much is costing the not covered two million people? How Has much? there been any estimate made of how much it's costing the nation not to cover the twenty million people? Um, I expect there probably have been. One doesn't come to mind immediately, but that's a good question um, because those people. Um, well, I'll tell you just an example. I was, I was talking with uh, Senator Bob Bennett, who was a senator from uh, Utah, and I thought a very good guy, but sort of fairly conservative, but the more conservative people in Utah uh, fired him. And I remember he was talking to me about uh, this plan that he and Senator Wyden were proposing. He said, you know, I say to people, we already have universal health insurance. I mean, you can go to the hospital if you're sick and be cared for free. But the problem with that is 
that's a very expensive way of doing it because those people should have had access to a primary care doctor who'd catch their problem early and treat them and keep them from needing the hospital. And so I think there is a real cost uh, to having people without uh, health insurance, but it comes in, in a disability and work days lost, uh, school days lost, uh, you know, et cetera. And uh, it'd be a good project to try to add that all up. Yes. So do you think, uh, or how far are we from a, a truly universal health insurance similar to what's in UK or Canada? Well, we are at least 30 million people uh, away from that. I mean, that, you know, it's, it's somewhat uncertain. There are varying estimates. I just picked that as what the Congressional Budget Office said some time ago. Um, the number will vary. Uh, there are many states with Republican governors who decided that they're not going to expand Medicaid up to everybody at 1.3 times the federal poverty line. And so the score would be better if they, as some states are doing now, negotiate with the government saying, well, we are willing to expand coverage, but we want to do it in a more market-oriented way or whatever. Uh, so it's, a, it's an uncertain and variable number, but take 30 million as an approximation. Yes, back here. Um, how does your, I think you called it the community health plan and or the Wyden Bennett plan uh, break the linkage to employment or not? And how do these plans address free riding? Well, let's see. The, the, in, in that model, uh, your, your insurance would not be linked to employment. Um, in fact, I even, uh, um, what's wrong with employer-sponsored health insurance? It locks most people into open-ended fee-for-service because employers don't have a very good record of, of offering choices. It means you lose your job. If you lose your job, you lose your insurance. Uh, employers uh, use it to compete for employees uh, by making their the insurance ever more generous. You know, we pay for everything. Come to work for us, we pay for everything, etc. cetera, um, including nobody understands their health insurance. It's, it's new. Probably if I asked for a show of hands here and said, how many of you have actually read your health insurance contract? <laughs> actually read it. <laughs> take a show of hands and if somebody raised their hand, I'd say, and did you understand it? <laughs> so uh, in Consumer Choice Health Plan, I had in mind a relatively simple standard definition of the insurance contract. It wouldn't include a very high deductible. Um, it, but you wouldn't look to the, your employer anymore. You would look to uh, the, the exchange where you, you'd get a subsidy. Now. What I proposed was that, like Stanford, um, your, the low price plan would be paid for. And if you wanted something more expensive, then you'd have to pay the difference. And that would bring market forces to bear. Um, at Wyden Bennett, uh, a, a similar idea. Um, now, what about free riders? Well, the Affordable Care Act does have uh, what uh, economists refer to as a tax on free riders. So if you don't, you could have health insurance free, mister, and if you don't, then, uh, you know, you'll, you'll have to pay this tax. Now, I, I do think that the free rider tax on the Affordable Care Act is, um, is gonna be problematic and difficult to collect and enforce and so forth, but that, that that's the best answer out there. Dr. Antoven? Oh, I, I have the microphone. Wait. <laughs> oh, here. Thank you. Great talk. I'm, a, I'm married to an MBA. I'm a physician. And I have a question that's been talked about in the doctor's lounges and in the boardrooms of hospitals. You so casually referred to the 30-day readmission rate as a marker of care somehow. And I, 
are you aware or do you have a comment on that we have no control over the non-compliant patient, the mentally ill patients, and those with chronic diseases who leave against medical advice, or they bounce out, don't take their medicines, and they come back within 30 days. And we care so much about those patients, but we have no control over their behavior once they leave. Well, it is a challenge, and I just think, <laughs> and I think you, you have to work on it. The problem, the problem comes from, I think, in large part, that um, when the patient leaves the hospital, they ought to be part of a delivery system that uh, right away picks them up and puts them into the ambulatory care system and works with them to make sure that they have their medications and that they take their meds and, and uh, you know, do whatever they can. Instead of, uh, you know, in the hospital that I've experienced, uh, like, like uh, wife has baby and in a wheelchair, <laughs> we take her to the hospital door and then the car pulls up and put them in, and then, you know, goodbye, <laughs> with, without uh, a lot of careful preparation for what's supposed to happen after they leave the hospital. It's, uh, there are going to be some uh, 30, within 30 day readmissions for the many reasons that you uh, uh, enumerated, but um, it's important to work on those post-hospitalization problems. Yes? How many, how many years before it becomes evident to Congress that there's a, a big flaw in the act, whether it's cost containment or some other portion of the act, and Congress has to do something new, and then what will they do? <laughs> uh, well, one thing is, one thing is, uh, Obama and the Democrats uh, have no shortage of critics who are pointing out the various flaws, and so it's hard to pick up a newspaper without reading about uh, one or another of the flaws in the Affordable Care Act, and I, I've mentioned a few. Uh, whether, when, whether and when the Congress will act to fix them, um, it uh, beats me. <laughs> but uh, I would say the direction they ought to go is to make it more universal, more cost contained. One of my big complaints about, uh, about the Affordable Care Act is I think nobody should just be offered uh, open-ended fee-for-service fully paid. I think like Stanford employees, you, you ought to have a subsidy that pays a fixed dollar amount, pays your way into a good quality integrated delivery system or whatever is out there, and then you have an incentive to choose the economical system. Um, and will we ever get there? I don't know. You know, we might. Probably not in my lifetime. Dr. Yeah. Hi. Oh, okay. Thank you for your decades of wonderful work in this area. I'm delighted to hear you today. I'm an OBGYN physician. I just want to try to encourage you to open your mind a little more about the reproductive health issues. I see women in those decisions. And, you know, in America, we are free from religious persecution. That's how America was founded. And I think that if we've agreed that women deserve reproductive health, we do, we've agreed that women deserve that, and that needs to be part of our health insurance, regardless of religious organizations having their own personal points of view. So I try to encourage you to change your thinking on that. Well, one good thing about <laughs> one good thing about uh, about breaking the link between employment and health insurance, I, I probably should have. Next time I do this, I'm going to put that on the slide is then the employer is not involved in the issue of the contents of your health insurance. And I just don't think it's, that it's a necessary or appropriate thing to have the employer involved in that. It ought to be just uh, uh, you know, out there on its own merits. So, um, yeah, that, that, that would be one, it, it's just, 
it seemed to me it was unnecessarily seeking or bringing about a conflict that didn't need to occur. Yes. You got to get the mic. Here it comes. By that, um, I'm puzzled by the um, difference in, in uh, billing between what the insurance company pays and what there's a number that's like four or five times as high uh, that appears on the bill, which, as, as far as I can tell, applies to anybody who can't afford to pay at all. <laughs> Uh, and uh, they're the only ones that have to pay that number. And that doesn't make any sense to me. And it's true of hospitals, it's yeah. true of uh, doctors, etc. Right. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. Um, let me explain where I, you know, how could this thing happen? It turns out that uh, hospitals have a very substantial number of patients who got there through the emergency room. And if this is a hospital that is not in the network of the insurance company covering the patient, then the poor guy <laughs> is, is at their mercy and they can just, and that they, they make a lot of money that way. Because people say, well, why do they do that and nobody pays that? Well, some people do pay it. It's the poor people who are there uh, as a result of an emergency or urgent situation. And, and I think that's wrong. I think I would favor some kind of a law that would say you can't charge more than, you know, something like 1.5 times Medicare or, you know, some reasonable limit. Otherwise, it's just, uh, it's just extorting people from, you know, it, it's taking advantage of the fact that, that people are, are sick, and especially for a nonprofit institution, I think it's uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, in, you know, inappropriate um, and wrong. Maybe this, maybe a thing to do. You know, uh, people have made the point that um, hospitals engage in a lot of business that for-profit companies do also. So. The for-profit companies refer to the nonprofit hospitals as not tax-paying hospitals. We're investor-owned tax-paying hospitals. <laughs> well, so that, that's been an issue. Perhaps the way to get at it would be to say, to change the law to say if you are a nonprofit hospital, then uh, you will not charge emergency patients more than 1.5 times Medicare or something like that. Oh. Want to give him the mic? No. Oh, some of you back there. Professor Antoven, uh, some have suggested that due to the intransigence of Congress, the divisiveness, that the inevitable outcome for the country is a Canada-style socialized medicine for the masses and a separate tier of premium care for those who can afford it. Do you think this is where we're heading? Um. You know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I think the Canadian system works pretty well for Canadians, but I, I don't think it would work here. Um, I, I, I don't see that out there. I mean, it's, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> will Congress act on something? <laughs> Only reluctantly and in a complex and confused way. <laughs> Dr. Burnett. This the is Dr. Burnett, my friend. A recent study by University of California showed that, that health care delivery systems controlled by physicians were at least 20% cheaper than hospital, than than medical care delivery systems controlled by hospitals. And there are many ways that physicians, uh, even in the fee-for-service system, can be peer-reviewed and under control and have uh, some 
future limitations and costs. Uh, there, I don't see any in hospitals, and I think about the Affordable Care Act uh, and having the group of hospitals and physicians, it's still going to be dominated by the ones that have the capital, which are the hospitals. There are, very, there are not lots of hospitals per population in many areas of the country. And how do you, what do you think is a solution to make this more efficient a system from the hospital side, not just in the medical side? Um, well, that's a very good question. I might just say Dr. Burnett has been a pioneer in this area. In He's been a physician leader in physicians getting organized to bring down the cost and improve the quality and so forth. Bob, I just read that article yesterday. Uh, the author, Jamie Robinson, is a good friend of mine, and I've, in, through the Integrated Healthcare Association, I've kind of seen that research progress. And what it happens is the hospital-owned me medical groups cost 1.41 times the non-hospital <laughs> It's a very remarked remark difference. Now, my reaction to that was, well, you know, the problem is with hospital administrators, their whole orientation has been uh, heads and beds. Keep the, keep the hospital full be, to, to be able to pay the overhead costs, which are usually large, and keep the CT scanners scanning and keep all that stuff to bring in the revenue. And the whole orientation of the efficient delivery system is let's do everything we can to keep the people healthy and keep them from needing hospital and see if we can empty those hospital beds. It's kind of a completely different orientation and mindset. And so I don't think that hospital administrators have the right uh, mindset and ethos uh, to be leaders in, in uh, healthcare systems and that it ought to be uh, physicians like, like you and your colleagues who pioneered in creating physician organizations. Um. Yes, um, my question is sort of a follow-up, but with a little different spin. The United States has far and away the most expensive health care per capita of any developed country, and we have worse outcomes on average. Right. And all those other countries where they spend less money and they get better, outcomes basically are single-payer systems. And for the life of me, I cannot understand why there isn't more serious, you know, consideration of a single-payer system in a capitalist country where we should be concerned about keeping the cost down and getting better outcomes. Well, I guess it's partly a problem that I, I have an attitude which was um, developed, I, I spent four years as an Assistant Secretary of Defense, and my job was to, to uh, bring cost effectiveness into defense decision making. And it was a quixotic task for a young man. <laughs> and what I learned was things like the ideal weapon system is built in 435 district, congressional districts. <laughs> you know, and, and if I look at uh, Medicare, the the pork barrel, the log rolling, uh, et cetera, I just don't see uh, any, I don't want to sound like a right-wing fanatic, but this is, I was, this is in the Democratic administration that I learned this. It's just, there are not enough people seriously interested in the total, holding down the total cost. And, and um, well, let me come at it another way. Um, I think it was Justice Brandeis who said that um, our system of government was based, it was built to prevent the arbitrary exercise of power. You know, so you think of Madison and ambition must be made to check ambition and so, so nothing can get done. In contrast to the parliamentary system, which is uh, a system that's very good for managing public programs. So Brandeis anyway say, our system of government is not built for the management, effective management of public programs. The huge difference between the parliamentary system and the um, uh, system of checks and balances that we have, just to go on for a moment. 
I've, I've done some work on the British National Health Service uh, at the invitation of British people come over and, and they've got their problems. I grant you for half the share of GDP they get better outcomes. I think for some, some interesting uh, reasons and um, um, anyway, so I was asked to, how, how could we bring some market forces and competition into the British National Health Service? And so Mrs. Thatcher uh, picked up on my ideas and tried to implement them, and some of the doctors didn't like it, and I was invited to lecture to the London Medical Society, and this doctor got up and said, uh, we live, we have an elected dictatorship. She can do whatever she wants, and there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> and so I said uh, uh, in reply, well, that's all very well, but I come from a country that doesn't have any government. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, all checks and balances. And so I, I just don't think it, our form of government is built for the effective management of public programs. And we can see that all over the place. Yeah. And that is a kind of a single payer system. Yeah. And I would wonder how many people in this auditorium on Medicare would want to get rid of it. Uh, well, I think it ought to be. Yeah, I okay. System, I, I think Medicare ought to be phased into a new model, which is, resembles what we do with Stanford for our employees. That is, the government, and by the way, Several bipartisan commissions and groups have recommended that we do this. One of the problems with Medicare that we've had is that we can't afford it. Uh, other than that, it's very nice. <laughs> and so the, al the alternative would be uh, what are called premium support payments and competing systems. And, and I think that's, that would be the way, the way to go. It, it comes back to Dr. Burnett's question. Oh, Dr. Burnett's question about uh, what are we going to do about the expensive hospital controlled delivery systems and my favorite answer would be subject them to uh, real competition, informed consumers, cost conscious consumers and they'd have to bring in leaders who want to give value for money. Yes. Um. I just I, w I worked in the Senate in the early 90s with a bipartisan for Senator Lieberman and a bipartisan group of senators who were moderates, trying to implement essentially your policy in the this mainstream yeah. coalition managed competition act, um, and the key the key thing that I wanted you to to bring out a little bit more in this discussion because I think it's really critical for people especially as we go into voting, and I will disclose that I. My group at Yale built the 30-day readmission measures, and my husband works for Obama, so I have my, my points of view. Um, but I, I hear you saying break the link to employer-mandated uh, employer, uh, plans, and also that what you're proposing is um, subsidized or supported uh, minimum plans with a competitive environment, a managed competitive environment. Now, I just I want to make sure that people understand that what I and I would like you to just contrast if you can that what advocates in Congress right now who are advocating changing or repealing or, or wholesale changes of Affordable Care Act, that's not what they're talking about because you're talking about a universal coverage, guaranteed benefit, and managed competition. Whereas people who are you know running campaign ads right now to pull down the Affordable Care Act are, as you say, they don't really say much, but that's not the direction you're going. You're going in a very constructive, actually yeah. essentially universal coverage direction. They are advocating for just wholesale repeal, or we're not sure what. And I, I'm wondering if you can draw that contrast, because there really is no mainstream senators anymore, right? It's a very yeah. polarized environment. Yeah. I want everybody to understand, I, I'm not a adherent of either political party. I'm in the party of the plague on both your houses. So I'm, <laughs> <coughs> so I'm, so I'm trying to avoid being partisan. And I just put, I put the point earlier very, very gently, which was, I have yet to hear from the Republicans when they say repeal and replace. I have yet to hear, and I'm listening for the replacement. Uh, and and oh, three senators from someplace got together and, and put out a plan, but it, it didn't deal with the, the big problems. So I, I accept that point that it's, uh, 
the, I, I think the critics ought to be able to explain this is what I would do, which I've done in writing. So my question is about the accountable care organizations. And to me, that's about the only way right now that's linking, right now on a fee-for-service, there's no link between the service provided and the outcome. Yeah. And the ACO is the only model that will link service and outcome. Right. And so it seems like the plan to roll that out or to apply it across the health system is really very limited. Can you talk a little bit about what the plan is for bringing ACOs out and, and it, it seems like they're just a very small fraction rather than this much bigger part that they should be. Okay, uh, let me put it this way. We've got an awful lot of people in the healthcare system that are still back in the 19th century. <laughs> you know, I t told you about the 19th century. And uh, maybe it's because they were taught the residency you know, in the residency program, don't rely on anybody else you know, you're individually responsible. So we've got a lot, a lot of mindsets from those olden days that have to be changed. And I think the idea with the Affordable Care Act, I mean, with the accountable care organizations, the idea was to start that process, to get doctors and hospitals to collaborate with some responsibility for quality and cost. And the ACOs do have a lot of quality measurement involved. And so that was a... a uh, uh, a step, as I said in my talk, a step in the right direction. I just think that the incentives ought to put it on steroids. <laughs> yes, sir. Doctor, uh, is this on? Uh, Dr. Antoven, uh, I have a business, so I'm a, a, an employer, and uh, not large enough to offer multiple programs to my employees, and I have to make the choice every year of what their health care is going to be. I hate it. It's a, it's a horrible responsibility. I can't wait till we get to these exchanges where I can just pay the bills and let somebody else right. choose. But I have noticed this is the first year in which our costs did not go up so much that we had to change our program. We actually, 8.25% increase in costs is the lowest it's been in the last 14 years. And we were able to keep the very same program for a second year. So. Do you have any sense of what the cost trajectory is since we're now in what the no. third or fourth year of uh, the ACA? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, you're gonna get a two-armed answer. <laughs> uh, starting back in around 2002, it had been, we'd gone for 50 years or whatever with the growth in national health spending each year being about 2.5 percentage points higher than the growth in the GDP. And starting back about then, uh, the growth rate relative to the GDP moderated considerably, came down to about 1%. And uh, economists have uh, analyzed it in detail and so forth. There isn't a consensus as to what brought it about. I mean, people talk about a lot of things like expensive drugs coming off patent, uh, or maybe just push back another, another thing maybe doing it is a lot of employers uh, have gone to high deductibles for their health plans. There's a very big increase in high deductibles, um, et cetera. And so the, the growth has moderated. I don't ascribe that to the Affordable Care Act. I don't think anybody else does either. Uh, it started before the Affordable Care Act. Uh, let's hope it continues, but I, I think that um, I, I think that high deductibles may help for a while, but I, I think in the long run that that's not going to be the answer because once people, you know, like say you have a fifteen hundred dollar deductible, you can't even walk past Stanford Hospital without being out fifteen hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so there you are in the hospital, and they say, oh, you you've you've used up your fifteen hundred and you wring your hands and say, oh, damn, there goes my 1500 Now, bring on the technology. And then, then you back to the cost unconscious uh, uh, situation. And so 
Um, uh, I doubt that de high deductibles, and, and there are other problems with them and so forth, but we don't have a good answer. Yes. Yeah. In the first two years of the Clinton administration, they tried to do something constructive and were punished viciously at the polls. Uh, my Senator Robert Bennett, who you spoke of, tried to do something constructive about health care and was punished vicious, viciously at the polls. And it appears that the Democrats, having been punished for Obamacare fairly badly in the recent past, are about to be punished again. Does this suggest that there's any chance that any sensible politician will try to do any of the things you believe in? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I don't know. I, I think <laughs> it is remarkable the negative reaction to Hillary Care. Uh, it wasn't even implemented. I think the non-passing of, of, of Hillary's 1,342-page bill, I'd been back there advising on it, so I was following it with some interest, um, is um, that she and Ira Magaziner and the legislative draftsman uh, kind of went in the back room and wrote up the whole thing. They had a big task force of 500 people. I was back there for a while wandering around the halls of the executive office building until I gave up. And uh, so they presented it to the Congress and I can just picture the scene. Some representative looks out the window and sees the bill sitting there on the front steps and says, that's not my baby. And over there, some senator looks and says, I'm not the father. And that's very different from the way Lyndon Johnson did Medicare. Lyndon Johnson, I'm told, wrote a one-page description. This is what Medicare ought to be. Wilbur Cohen, my secretary of Health and Human Services, you take it over to Wilbur Mills, the chairman of Ways and Means, and you start working it out. And if you agree, if we can get, and so, you know, all the people in the Congress got to put their fingerprints on it and uh, it sort of grew or organically. If you agree, then we'll lock arms and walk forward and say we have Medicare. So you have to involve the Congress. And it is, it is dangerous territory. At the time with, when with Hillary Care failed, we all said, oh, it'll be another 20 years before they try again. And maybe it'll be another 20 years. Uh, although I have some hope that the private sector through exchanges might be um, able to uh, reform the system a lot. Mm -hmm.